started. Father, we're thankful for your word for us, and we're thankful for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Tonight, as we study this uh, sacrament, may it be for your glory. May we connect uh, to you, and may we connect to one another, as we pray in Jesus' name, indeed. Amen. So we're going to look at four texts uh, to begin with tonight, uh, and then we're going to um, look at a couple of different ways uh, various parts of the church understand uh, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So these texts are um, crucial. They're called the words of institution. Uh, and the scripture has uh, four uh, variations on this. All of them fit together fairly well. Um, and so we can certainly see how some people heard uh, some things and they remembered and wrote those things down. Some people heard other things. Um, but none of these none of these words of institution are identical, but they are all congruent. They all work together. So Matthew's gospel, it tells it like this, beginning in verse 26 of chapter 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. He took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant. Um, some versions have this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Uh, if you recognize that this, because these are the, this are the words of institution that uh, we use. Um, I typically use uh, in the Lord's supper. Um, and so Matthew's uh, gospel uh, pays uh, careful attention to the connection between that, which is signified bread, body, uh, cup or wine, blood, uh, and also gives attention to this being uh, a covenant, and especially a covenant, uh, a new covenant being created uh, in Christ. Uh, and indeed, this renewal of this covenant will not take place again uh, until um, Jesus returns and glory comes and we feast together uh, at the wedding feast of the Lamb. So let's jump over to Mark chapter 14. We're going to begin in verse 22, very similar to Matthew. As they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body, he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. All right. So Matthew uh, was there, heard it. He said, Jesus said, My father's kingdom. Mark, who is really uh writing down the memoirs of the Apostle Peter, that's what Gospel of Mark is, uh, says it is the kingdom of God, are these um, two ideas uh, anathema to each other? No, of course not, they work together, the kingdom of God, my father's kingdom, it's two ways of saying the same thing. So, um, but they also, um, both Matthew and Mark, and we'll highlight this here, um, they limit the extent of this covenant all right, to the many, right? Many is, is a lot, but it's not everyone. So universalism doesn't work from the covenantal perspective of the sacrament. Uh, rather, his blood being poured out for many uh, refers, especially in Reformed theology, we would say uh, refers to the elect. Okay, Luke, uh, Luke brings in uh, other aspects uh, of the supper uh, and certainly uh, will be more um, give more kind of surrounding uh, things that were happening uh, at the supper. Uh, and so it's a longer passage. So we'll begin here in Luke 22 and verse 14. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat and I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Right? So there's this idea that there is another feast. In fact, the next Passover feast that Jesus will ever eat is when it is all is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That's a eschatological reference to the wedding feast of the Lamb, to the great feast of the Lamb at the end of all things. When we will celebrate not the Passover, not the uh, first Passover, when uh, the angel of death passes over those houses painted with the blood of the Lamb but rather the fulfilled Passover when uh, the saints, the elect, are delivered uh, into glory uh, for all time, and they are past, God's wrath passes over them forever. Okay, 
So then he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he said, take this and divide among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So reiterating the same point. So as they're eating the meal, remember the main event at the Passover meal is the lamb. He's telling them that I'm not going to eat again uh, a meal like this until that day. And I'm not going to drink with you again until that day. Right. So and then we get the words of institution begin in 19. And he took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. For behold, the hand of man, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. The son of man goes as it's been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this, right? So the supper is shared. Uh, and it is this pronouncement that this is a new covenant in his blood, that those who are under the coverage of his blood will be delivered on that last day uh, and will sit and feast with him uh, forever uh, in the kingdom of God. So those are the major uh, ideas coming from the Gospel of Luke. And so the Apostle Paul has his own telling of this uh, nestled in the middle of a longer section. Uh, indeed, we'll be looking at... Um, We'll be looking at most of uh, what he deals with from 1 Corinthians 11 uh, in several chunks this evening, which will be pertinent to various uh, paragraphs uh, of the Westminster. But the one that's important for us to get up front uh, is uh, the Apostle Paul giving the words of institution. And this is really important um, because this is the first written record of the words of institution. So the Apostle Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthians uh, in the late 50s uh, is when he's writing it, usually dated around 57, um, is predates uh, even the earliest gospel, which would be the gospel of Mark, which uh, usually is dated sometime between the year 60 uh, and 65. So here the Apostle Paul uh, is reminding the Corinthians who have been making a real mess of this, uh, and that's the nicest thing you can say about the Corinthians' relationship uh, to the Lord's Supper. They've been making a real mess of this, excuse me, uh, and he's trying to correct them by reminding them what the Lord Jesus did on the night that he was betrayed. So the apostle beginning in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right. So he's reminding the Corinthians who are not treating each other very well. They're not waiting for each other. They are approaching the table in an unworthy manner. Uh, he's reminding them what this sacrament means, right? what it means. And in reminding them what it means, he's trying to correct uh, their error, because their error is much bigger than they're doing the Lord's Supper wrong. He's saying that doing the Lord's Supper wrong is actually a symptom of a greater error uh, in that you have divorced yourself from one another. In other words, you don't believe that the community, the ecclesia, the church matters. And so you can, if you can't connect with each other, then you have to have real questions about your connection with Christ, right? So that's, that's what the Apostle Paul is uh, trying to get across to them here uh, in very short order. Okay, um, I'm hoping that this is going to work and look okay. I think it does. Okay, so I had a uh, local artist, uh, very local to me, my daughter Marion, uh, helped me uh, with illustrating uh, some different uh, ways that um, various parts of the church understand what's going on uh, at the Lord's Supper. Uh, now, the first three that we're going to look at, transubstantiation, which of course is dealt with uh, in the Confession, uh, and is condemned. It's the Roman Catholic understanding, and some Anglo-Catholics certainly hold this view. Uh, we're going to talk a, a little bit about consubstantiation, which would be Martin Luther's view and the, and the view of the Lutheran Church today. We're going to talk about uh, the ordinance-only view, which would be the Anabaptists, and, and in many Baptist churches today, that's uh, how they understand the Lord's Supper. Uh, and I will tell you why we don't, as Presbyterians, hold to these views. Uh, and then we're going to look at three uh, reform views, one that uh, we have largely rejected in the reform tradition, uh, and then two that we um, sort of exist side by side um, 
and there's only a slight variation between them. So those would be the, uh, the symbolic remembrance, that would be the views of Zwingli, uh, symbolic parallelism, which would be the views of Heinrich Bollinger, uh, and then symbolic instrumentalism, which would be the view of John Calvin. So let's start with transubstantiation. Um, you can find hints of a view of transubstantiation prior to Thomas Aquinas in the 12th century. Not 12th century, 13th century, but um, you can find hints of some view that there is somehow a physical presence of Jesus in the elements uh, and that the priest uh, is responsible for for removing that which was and putting in that which is new before that. But it's really Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica who brings Aristotelian metaphysics uh, and Christianity together uh, and forms what will become transubstantiation. So in Aristotelian metaphysics, uh, everything in, in existence has um, an essence, a yeah, substance is what the term he uses for this. Uh, and the substance is sort of the soul of what it is, right? It's the soul of what it is. Um, and so if you, you, pastors always use chairs for this example. So there may be very, you know, you may look around your house and there's a number of different kinds of chairs uh, in your house, but all of them in essence are the same thing. There's something for you to sit on. Right. So the outside or its physical appearance is, what's, is what Aristotle would call the accident. And so the accident uh, can change and be different, but in essence, um, that's what matters. So what Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas argued, uh, is that at the Lord's Supper, what is happening is that the accident of the bread uh, and the wine through the intervention of the priest in the mass the accident, the outside of bread and wine. So if you eat the bread, it tastes like bread. You drink the wine, it tastes like wine. Um, the accident remains the same, but the substance, right? What it is in essence, see, you can see here, Mary drew them like the bats. I said, those look like bats. I said, actually, that's fine. She said, should they look more like birds? I said, no, bats is fine. Um, the essence, you know, is removed by the priest, by this ritual and the essence of Christ physical body and blood is placed into the elements, right? And this is a permanent change, right? It's a permanent change. So once this transformation has taken place, once this transubstantiation has taken place uh, and the substance of those bread and wine are removed and the substance of Christ is placed into the accident, right? Into the elements, uh, then that's a permanent change. Right. And so after um, a Catholic mass, uh, their worship service, uh, then the wine all has to be consumed because it can't be saved. And the bread, because they use these you know, unleavened wafers, which I think will last. What did somebody tell me one time that, you know, they'll go bad in about, you know, 200 years. Right. Um, they take the remainder of those and they keep them in a special box in the sanctuary that they call the tabernacle. Because Catholics believe that that is now the presence of Christ, right? And so the wafer is often uh, worship um, in a way that most Protestants and especially Presbyterians uh, would find disturbing, uh, but we'll come to that later. So we don't believe as Presbyterians that this is what happens. Uh, we think that this is not a biblical view of what happens at the Lord's Supper. Um, as we have a couple of problems with it. One, we don't believe that any human being, even if they're ordained, has the power to start changing the substance of things. That seems like magic uh, to a large extent. Uh, two, um, we don't find anywhere in the scripture where it says that this is what happens, right? Um, as Van Dixhorn, and we'll make this point a little bit later, right? Something doesn't have to be a simile to be a metaphor, right? When Jesus says, this is my body, he's not saying this is literally his body because his body is actually present there. It's not even in glory. And he has normal flesh and blood, as he points out in Luke 24, 39. Um, and so this idea is, it, it, it just doesn't work um, because Jesus can't be handing bread to people and say, this is my body when his body is present there, not even uh, in glory. Um, and so we 
uh, largely uh, reject this uh, viewpoint, right? So the um, this would have been the other view out that the Westminster divides were uh, sort of arrayed against, right? So those Anglo Catholics, remember those Lodians, right, who were sort of the bitter enemies of these folks who would eventually gather at the Westminster Assembly, they held a, a kind of like a transubstantiation light view of things. Um, and by and large, the um, Westminster divides, which is why they specifically address transubstantiation, uh, they reject it. They don't find it to be biblical. I don't find it to be biblical. There's a reason I'm a Presbyterian and not a Catholic. Okay, so let's take a look at another one of these. That's not the one we want. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, so this is, um, we're going to talk about consubstantiation. So consubstantiation uh, is the view of Martin Luther, right? So in 1529, at the Colloquy of Marburg, uh, Martin Luther, who is largely responsible for what we might consider the Northern Reformation, uh, and, and Ulrich Zwingli, who's responsible for the Southern Reformation. So Luther and what will be Germany, uh, Zwingli and what will be Switzerland, uh, they and some of their chief lieutenants and other theologians get together and what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, okay, what we need to do uh, is merge this reformation, right? There's safety in numbers because remember the 30 years war will come and it will kill a lot of Protestants and a lot of Catholics, right? All of these things will happen, right? But there's safety in numbers. So if we can get together, then we can maybe hit critical mass, right? And so, um, kind of Luther's chief lieutenant, a man named Melanchthon, and Zwingli's chief lieutenant, a man named Bollinger. We'll talk more about Bollinger in a little bit. Uh, they're pretty optimistic that they can get this done, but both of them are also pretty sure uh, that the best way to get this done is for Luther and Zwingli to stay home, right? These are both headstrong men. They're strong personalities, and they don't back down, right? They wouldn't be starting the Reformation if they backed down, right? So Luther in 1517 in Germany, Zwingli in 1522 in Switzerland, and specifically Zurich, right? They're, they wouldn't have done what they did if these were guys who were willing to compromise. Well, by God's grace, they were able to come to an understanding and accord on almost every point, 13 of 14 points of doctrine that they discussed. But on the point of the Lord's Supper, Luther basically said that Zwingli uh, had a deficient view of the words of Christ. When Jesus said, this is my body, Luther says that has to be literal. And Zwingli says, in essence, doesn't have to be a simile to be a metaphor. It can be a metaphor. It doesn't have to be uh, literally true. So Luther also doesn't want to hold to transubstantiation, right? He doesn't think that the priest has the ability to transform the substance, right? And so Luther goes um, and develops alongside his Christology, the doctrine of ubiquity, U-B-I-Q-U-I-T-Y, ubiquity. Um, and so the doctrine of ubiquity basically says that since you have uh, this hypostatic union of the two natures of Christ in the one person, right? So remember, fully God, fully human in one person, right? Without mixing and without separation, right? This is one person here. Um, then if the, pre if the son, the divine son of God is present, then his humanity can also be present wherever his divinity is present, since you have that union between the two persons. Right? And so branching off of that, and I'm not giving both transubstantiation and consubstantiation, there's much longer discussions and arguments you can, you know, you can read from their perspective. I'm just trying to get you a, a quick understanding of what's going on here. So Luther, based on his idea of ubiquity, um, says that, okay, well, you can, it can be two things at once, right? It can be the regular bread and wine, and it can also be the physical presence of Jesus' body and blood at the same time. Now, it's not a permanent change. It only is applicable for the sacramental moment, right? For the moment that it is being um, given and received, right? But for those moments, Jesus can be physically present uh, in these physical elements, just as his divinity could be present uh, in his physical humanity. So, and his, his humanity can be present where his divinity is. So Jesus can be present uh, in the elements. So when the worshiper receives these elements of bread and wine, 
when the worshiper takes those things in, then he is receiving the physical presence of Jesus in the moment that he receives them. All right, so that's what's going on uh, with consubstantiation. So let's, uh, oh, that's the one we want. Let me find it real quick. Oh, there it is. Okay, so let's talk about the ordinance view. So we certainly do talk about the sacraments as holy ordinances. Uh, and by that, we mean these are things that Jesus said, uh, do this, right? And we as Presbyterians and Lutherans and Roman Catholics, they all do the Lord's Supper because Jesus said, do this. But we believe that there is a presence of Jesus in these things. When Jesus says, this is my body, whether that is a physical presence, Lutherans and Catholics, or that is a uh, spiritual presence in the Reformed idea of things, we believe that Jesus is somehow present as we take these elements. The ordinance only view, which is the one uh, you're kind of looking at here, says, well, no. At best, we can get Zwingliism, which is what we'll talk about next, where the Holy Spirit is communicating to your soul, maybe to your mind. Um, but mostly in this viewpoint, the reason that we do the Lord's Supper is because Jesus said, do this, right? Because the Holy Scripture, Jesus holding the Bible down there, uh, the Holy Scripture said, this is something you need to do. You need to take these elements. Right? And so you're doing this uh, largely as an act of obedience. Uh, the ordinance view of baptism and the ordinance view of the Lord's Supper, uh, their main problem is that they center the action in the worshiper. They center the action in the one receiving the sacraments, right? Which is why in the ordinance only view, you can only um, baptize those uh, who are old enough to make a profession of faith. You couldn't baptize a baby, for instance, uh, because the worshiper has to be able to express faith because baptism is primarily about the worshiper's experience of obedience to Christ. Right? Now, none of the other views exclude the worshiper's obedience to Christ in doing as the Lord has said, but they believe that there's something more going on. Right. And so we view the ordinance only view uh, as a deficient view of the sacrament, as much as we would view this transubstantiation view as deficient. I've never seen somebody try to pass off con or transubstantiation uh, in a presbytery exam. I have on more than one occasion see people try to pass off the ordinance only view uh, for uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, and so we think that there is some presence of Christ in this, as we'll explore in the confession. Uh, and so it is important for us to understand exactly how Christ is present. We don't think he's physically present, but we also don't think he's absent, right? And so we want to reject both of the extremes. So let's see here. Yeah. So here's uh, Zwinglianism. This is called symbolic remembrance. So we take these elements, right? Here we are. You can see the Holy Spirit there behind the worshiper. Uh, and as the worshiper is taking in the physical elements, the Holy Spirit brings to mind remembrance, um, the sacrifice of Christ. And so in that remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ, Christ is present with the worshiper, right? But it's largely something that happens in the mind, perhaps in the soul, uh, and the physical elements don't have a role, right? And so the question for Zwingli, that, that Zwingli would have got had he not been killed in battle <laughs> before he probably could have answered these questions, the question um, that perhaps later uh, theologians would have had uh, for Zwingli is, what's, why would the elements matter then? Because if all it takes is the Holy Spirit bringing to mind or remembrance the sacrifice of Christ, then we have a sacramental moment anytime the Holy Spirit brings to mind that Christ has died uh, to save us from our sins. So let's deal with uh, Bollinger. This is called symbolic parallelism. This happens to be my view, um, but it's not the only acceptable reform view. Uh, Zwinglianism largely is rejected in most reform theology. Uh, it's viewed as deficient, uh, largely because the elements don't matter. All right, and Jesus does tell us to do this, to eat this bread and to drink this cup. Uh, and so we have to understand that the cup and the bread matter, right? Because they are the signs that are pointing to that which is signified. So in Bollinger's view, remember Bollinger was, took over for Zwingli in Zurich after Zwingli was killed in battle. Um, 
And so Bollinger's view uh, says, well, no, there is something going on here, right? So as you eat these physical elements at the same time in parallel, the Holy Spirit is communicating the spiritual presence of Christ to your soul, right? So as you're eating these things at the same time, the Holy Spirit at that very moment is communicating the spiritual presence of Christ to you, right? You are eating physical things, but you are also being nourished on the grace of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit at the same time. So it's these two things happening in tandem, right? They happen together uh, so that the elements matter and there is a real but spiritual presence of Christ, not a physical presence of Christ uh, at the table. So if you were to present this view, say at the presbytery, you would be fine. Uh, people would say that's just fine. Um, but the one that most people prefer uh, is Calvin's view, which is called symbolic instrumentalism. And so in this view, uh, it's not that there is a physical presence of Jesus in the elements, but rather as you take the elements, the Holy Spirit is communicating through those physical elements the spiritual presence of Christ, right? And that spiritual presence is feeding your soul just as the physical elements are feeding your body, right? So again, in both symbolic parallelism and symbolic instrumentalism, it is a spiritual presence of Christ, not a physical presence, but it is a real presence, right? In both of those, as you take these physical elements, the Holy Spirit is communicating either in parallel or through those elements, the grace of Jesus Christ to your soul, right? It, it is truly, you are tasting grace, right? In your soul, as you taste the physical elements with your tongue. So that's what's going on here uh, in these texts. So which views uh, do we hold in, uh, which views can, can you really garner from Westminster Confession? Uh, as we're gonna see, um, Calvin's view is probably the one uh, that they are uh, most in line with, but Bollinger's view uh, is certainly acceptable. Uh, Zwingli, you're a little bit, you're, you're just over the line, you're a little too far. Uh, the ordinance only view, because there's no presence of Christ, then would not be acceptable from a Westminster standpoint. And of course, both tran transubstantiation and consubstantiation, because uh, there is that physical element that they would view those uh, as um, just not uh, what the Bible teaches. Uh, Lutherans certainly make a pretty strong argument when Jesus says, this is my body, he meant it. Um, but, you know, Again, the reformed rejoinder to that is always, it doesn't have to be a simile to be a metaphor, right? We don't have to use the word like, this is bread is like my body for it to be a metaphor. We can just say, this is my body, and that can be a metaphor. That's Jesus physically present as holding the bread. Okay, so those are the views. Um, so these are Marian Strong's. If you're interested in any of them, I can send you uh, any one that you like. I don't know what you do with it, but if you wanted it, you're certainly welcome to them. Before anybody thinks, I did pay my daughter for the drawing. So I, the worker's worthy of the hire. So just so you all know. <laughs> oh, I jumped to the wrong thing. I meant to jump to the confession. There it is. All right. So here we are uh, in Westminster chapter 29. Okay, so we've done a lot of the heavy lifting already this evening, so we're going to move through this uh, in fairly quick order uh, through the paragraphs here tonight. So the night Jesus was betrayed, he instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, we read those texts, called the Lord's Supper to be observed in his church until the end of the world as a perpetual remembrance of his sacrifice and death and as a seal of all the benefits of that sacrifice for true believers. All right, Jesus said, do it. That's called the medical command, so we do it. But it is also a seal of his benefits, right? So it's this remembrance of what Christ has done. And as that takes place, we are sealed into the benefits of his sacrifice. In other words, it is a means of grace. It is a way by which we actually receive grace. So baptism is received only once in a person's lifetime. The Lord's Supper is received many times in a person's lifetime. Uh, and so while the... We can certainly see in the waters of baptism, the communication of the grace by the Holy Spirit uh, to the one being baptized. We can certainly see in the Lord's Supper, this 
consistent and constant communication of grace to the believer, right? So that's how it's a seal, right? It's God's signature on your life saying, you are one who is covered by the blood, uh, the new blood, the new covenant in Christ's blood. I can speak tonight. There we are. Okay, well, what about the sign element of the Lord's Supper? Well, that's the next next sentence. It also signifies the spiritual nourishment and growth of believers in Jesus and their additional commitment to perform all the duties they owe him, right? So on the one hand, right, it signifies spiritual nourishment as you are eating physical things, even just little portions of them. As you're eating these physical things, it reminds you that you are nourished in the grace of Jesus Christ And that you are to grow, right, just as we eat food, right, to fuel the body so that we can grow uh, when we're young um, and hopefully not when we're old, right, because we're not growing any taller, but we might grow a little bigger. Um, But we eat food to nourish the body so that we can grow and be strong. So also we take in the sacramental food, right, so that the Holy Spirit can communicate spiritually the nourishment that is ours in Christ, what we call his grace. But as we receive that, we are also, we are also clearly, um, clearly called to follow Jesus, right? It's a powerful symbol of our communion with Christ by his Holy Spirit, and it commits us to his service, right? To the duties that we owe him. So let's take a quick look uh, and a text that helps to illustrate this from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or frees, and all were made to drink of one spirit, right? So we share in this one spirit, and we are baptized uh, into this one Christ. Let's pop forward. I meant to grab verse 12 too. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. So we are engrafted into the one Christ, and into this one Christ, we are connected with other believers. So let's take a look at one more text along those lines. This is from 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake uh, of the one bread. So the idea here in the last sentence is because this sacrament connects us to Jesus, it also connects us to one another. So finally, it is bond and pledge of believers' communion with Jesus and with each other as members of his mystical body, right? We who are many, are one body. And because we're one body, we belong together as we belong to Christ. So that's what's going on, right? So if you're looking for what is the power that's going on in the Lord's Supper, well, it's basically that, right? It, it tells you that the benefits of Christ belong to you salvation, grace, those belong to you. It is nourishment so that you grow and mature in Christ, so that you can live a life that denies the self, takes up the cross, and follows him, right? That serves him, that gives him the duties that he is owed, right? But it is also a connection, right? Just like anytime you invite somebody over to sit down and eat, you're forming a connection, you're forming a bond, right? And so that bond is first and foremost uh, with Christ, right? And it It gives us a pledge. It it connects us uh, in promise to Christ uh, and also to each other as the body of Christ. Okay, so let's talk about what we're doing uh, at the supper. So we talked about various views of these, uh, and the Westminster Divines are certainly going to tell you um, that the transubstantiation view in the next several paragraphs uh, is not okay because uh, it is largely viewed as a new sacrifice of Christ. And there is no need for a new sacrifice of Christ because Christ gave a once for all sacrifice. So let's take a look at at this text here, uh, beginning uh, in uh, paragraph two. In this sacrament, Christ is not offered up to his father, nor is any actual sacrifice made for the remission of sins of the living or the dead. So one of the things Catholics would do, still do, uh, is that they would, uh, you could have a mass said for somebody who has died so that their sins would be forgiven. So you can cut off years from their time in purgatory so that they can enter into heaven a, a little faster, right? But that would require another sacrifice. So the mass is seen as a sacrifice. Right, as a sacrifice, you're once again offering up the body and the blood of Jesus, right? And the Westminster divines and indeed 
Presbyterians in general and, and reform people who hold to reform theology find this abhorrent, right? The once for all sacrifice for Christ uh, is enough. So let's take a look at a text from uh, the letter to the Hebrews. We're going to jump back up to verse 22 here. It says, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, right? So we need blood, shed blood in order for sins to be forgiven, right? Biblical axiom, just something you need, right? So blood has to be shed for sins to be forgiven. Pretty clear from the Old Testament that that's true. Okay, so what about Jesus? Well, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these, right? So he's talking about the Old Testament sacrifices, right? And that the uh, various elements in, in the temple, both the first and second temple, various elements uh, in the temple uh, had to be purified through the sacrificial rites that were performed. But the heavenly ones on which these earthly ones were based, right, if they're to be purified, then they're going to have to be purified with a better sacrifice, right, with a purer sacrifice. So how do you get a better and purer sacrifice? Well, you have to have one who is a perfect substitute for humanity. So it has to be a human being, uh, but also has to be an innocent human being. And that doesn't pertain to anyone except for Jesus. Okay. So the author of Hebrews goes on and says in verse 24, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, right? So Christ hasn't just entered even into the most holy place in the temple, the holy of holies. Christ has gone into heaven, into the very presence of God, right? And in order for him to do that, right, in order for the high priest to enter into the holy of holies, he has to go through an elaborate series of rituals that we'll cover next year in our Leviticus class. And so if Christ is going to enter into the presence of God, he must be even purer, even more innocent, right, even more forgiven in some regard um, than the high priest is. Now, Christ has no sin to be forgiven of, and so he automatically is innocent, but to be purified by his own blood allows him to enter into the presence of God. That's what the author of Hebrews is, off, is arguing nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, right? And this is the point that Westminster Divines wants you to grab onto, right? So we're not offering Christ up repeatedly. No, one time. He offers himself one time and one time only, right? But the high priest, the author goes on, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own, but then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So the high priest every year, had to go through the elaborate ritual so he could enter into uh, the inner sanctum, into the Holy of Holies, uh, and offer up the blood uh, on the elements within that inner sanctum, right? And he's entering into the presence of God, Shekinah glory. And because he's entering into that presence, every single time he does that, he has to go through this elaborate series of rituals. The other Hebrews are saying, but Christ doesn't have to do that because he's He's already entered into the holiest of all holy places, and that is the very presence of God, right? And he doesn't come with deficient sacrificial blood. He comes with his own blood, which is of immeasurable worth. And so he doesn't have to keep doing this over and over and over again. And indeed, his blood is not just enough to get him to enter into the presence of God. It's actually enough to put away sin. Right? So that all those who are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ through faith, all of them can enter into the presence of God once for all. Christ doesn't have to be sacrificed over and over and over again. His blood was already shed on the cross. It's done and over. Right? So let's continue. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him, right? So Christ has died, and he's died once, and that's it. It's over. He's never going to die again, but he will come again, not to die for sins. That's already been done, but rather to welcome, right, those who are eagerly waiting for them, right, to save them, to gather them to himself, uh, and to bring them into glory. So that's uh, largely what is going on here uh, in uh, 
the second paragraph is we are saying no to repeated sacrifice. So it's not a new sacrifice of Christ as the Catholic mass uh, would have it, but rather we say in the second sentence, the sacrament commemorates Christ's offering up of himself by himself on the cross once for all and spiritually offers up to God every possible praise for that sacrifice. So the only sacrifice going on at that table, right? It's not an altar. We're not sacrificing anything in the Presbyterian church. We have communion tables. The only thing going on at that table right, is the sacrifice of praise, right? We are praising God for the once for all sacrifice that Christ has made to forgive us of our sins, right? We commemorate, we remember, right? We bring to mind, right? That's what commemorate means, that which has already been, right? That which has already been. Consequently, the so-called sacrifice of the Roman Catholic Mass does the testable injustice to Christ's one sacrifice, which is the only propitiation for all the sins of the elect, right? So propitiation means that something enters into our relationship between us and God uh, to bring about the forgiveness of sins, right? And that is the once for all sacrifice of Christ. He does not need to be sacrificed again. Roman Catholic Mass implies and sometimes quite blatantly states that Christ is being offered up and being sacrificed again on the altar in the Roman Catholic Mass over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, right? And from the Book of Hebrews standpoint, at least in the Reformed reading of the Book of Hebrews, that idea is abhorrent, right? It calls it detestable, detestable injustice, right? That's pretty strong language, right? Those are fighting words from Westminster Divines. So once for all sacrifice, we're not offering Christ up as a sacrifice again. Rather, we are commemorating the one sacrifice that he has done. Okay, let's jump down to, well, let's take a look at one more. I think we already covered that. Yeah, uh, let's, let's take a look at one more idea here uh, that'll come out of that. So uh, from Hebrews 10, 14, for by a single offering, he is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, right? So we don't need another offering, um, but it also does away with the idea of priests, right? We don't have priests, right? So in even Anglo-Catholics refer to themselves as priests, right? Even Anglicans today, they call their pastors. Sometimes they call them vicars, but a lot of times they call them priests. Um, and priests offer sacrifices. And since our uh, religious leaders as Presbyterians are not offering sacrifices and we don't understand them as offering sacrifices, um, I'm not a priest in that sense. Now, in the traditional uh, ordination in the EPC, we do say that the pastor is to be the priest to the people, but that's uh, a statement of intercessory prayer, which is one of the other jobs of the priest. Uh, not to offer the sacrifice of Christ again, but rather to uh, throw oneself on uh, the mercy of the court, so to speak, on behalf of the congregation uh, and the once for all sacrifice of Christ. So no more priests, right? And so we can get this idea from Hebrews 7. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever, right? So the church has a priest, his name is Jesus. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them, right? Christ's intercession never fails and it never stops, right? And so if you draw near to God through him, then he is your intercessor. You don't need an earthly intercessor and you don't need one to offer sacrifice either. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily. First for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Right? So Jesus, once for all sacrifice, is the only one uh, that we need. Right? We don't need other priests. So that's why you call me pastor, not priest. Okay, paragraph three. So this is kind of a how-to guide on how paragraph three is how to preside over the table. So this is instruction for pastors. These are the things you're supposed to do uh, when you preside at the table. That's what we call, you know, you can officiate at the table or preside at the table, right? Those are the ideas. Okay, so in the administration of the Lord's Supper, Jesus has directed his ministers to declare to the congregation his words instituting the sacrament, right? 
So that's why before we celebrate the Lord's Supper, you will hear me usually from Matthew. Sometimes I'll use Luke or, or Mark or even First Corinthians 11, depending on the occasion, but um, I pretty almost always use Matthew. Uh, and I have a story for that if you ever want to know it another time. So um, Jesus uses these, uh, has instructed us to officiate at this table. And so we state the words of institution, right? On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread after blessing it. He broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. After the supper was over, he took a cup. And again, he gave God thanks and praise, gave it to his disciples, told his disciples, drink of this, all of you, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Right. And then we usually add uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 26. First often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right. Words of institution. Right. So they are important. So they have to be stated. Right. There has to be a prayer that's being offered. Right. We are setting aside these ordinary things in the sacramental moment for an extraordinary purpose. We're praying for the Holy Spirit to move among us and to communicate the grace of Christ to us. Right. We bless the bread and the wine in that prayer thus set apart for their ordinary use and put to a holy use in that moment. Right? His ministers are to take the bread and uh, are to take and break the bread. So we have to have bread that we break as part of this and we take the cup, right? So we pour into the cup. Um, I, I've never had actually a pitcher to pour things into until I came to Parkway. So I'm kind of, it's new to me, but I'm enjoying it. Uh, so they take the cup, right? And so then we offer these things to the people now. The one who is presiding at the table must also, right, must also participate in the sacrament, right? So it's not like, well, I'll, I'll get this ready for you all, but I'm not going to have any myself. So like even when we do communion with our uh, shut-in folks, uh, I participate in communion with them. Um, I had a deacon once uh, go, go around with me and do that for uh, a while in my last congregation, uh, and she's like, well, I've already received the Lord's Supper today. I said, well, it doesn't matter if you've received it once today. You're going, this is a community event, right? We're, we're a community. We're all in this together. And if we're sitting here and sharing the Lord's Supper with one of our members, then you're going to participate in it. Even if uh, in that particular, we went around uh, two of our uh, kind of senior homes uh, in the town that we were in. Uh, and I would uh, often officiate at the Lord's Supper for those folks um, three, four, sometimes five times. Uh, and she said, well, I'm going to be too full for lunch. I said, well, that's, that's, that's part of the job. <laughs> yes. So um, if you're going to take the cup, you're going to, the, the one who is presiding at the table, that's the pastor, that's me, uh, has to participate. And both of those um, elements have to be given to the communicants. That would be you, the congregation. Right, but not to anyone else not present at that time of the congregation. And we'll come back to that idea in just one moment. So the idea here uh, largely is this has to be a sacrament for the whole community, right? Everybody participates, the pastor and the congregation. Now, it was common in Roman Catholic churches at the time of the Reformation uh, for only the bread to be offered to the people, right? The cup, because people might spill it. Right, and that they'd be spilling the, the blood of the Lord on the floor was not offered to the peasantry. Right, so you if you weren't aristocrat, you weren't going to receive the cup. Right? You had to be part of the specials, right, to do that. Right, and so um, that idea doesn't have any place in Scripture. So the Westminster Divines were right to reject it. You have to receive both the bread and the cup uh, in order to participate. Now, why would they say not anyone else not present at the time of the congregation? So this is um, one of those things where uh, we, you know, are they saying that, you know, if we were to bring, you know, say communion to one of our shut-in folks uh, who can't make it out to worship for health reasons, uh, that we're breaking what Westminster's saying. No, Westminster doesn't really, that's not on their radar. That's not what they're talking about. Because there's another practice of a private communion service, right? So this idea that, um, you know, we don't want to mix with the hoi polloi because, you know, I'm, you know, uh, aristocrat or I'm you know, royalty or I'm rich or whatever it is. And so I will have my own private worship service uh, where I'll receive uh, communion on my own. Uh, and they said, no, that's not going to work. You don't get to have a private worship service, right? Is this a, because uh, back in paragraph one, and we certainly got this idea um, from First Corinthians, 
because this is not just a connection, right, with Christ, but also a connection with the community, then the community has to be able to be present. Right. So when we take communion to our shut-in folks, we are extending the table to them to be part of the community. Right? We're not excluding anybody from participating, but rather we are becoming inclusive of people who otherwise would not be able to participate uh, in the Lord's Supper. Now, the other thing that the Westminster Divines here are, are not just those idea of the private service for the kind of the hoity-toity, um, but the other thing that they are against uh, is the private mass. So that would be just the pastor, you know, performing the, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for himself, uh, usually for pay. Somebody's paying you to do it on behalf of a dead loved one. Um, and uh, they're saying, no, that won't work either. It's, it's a community meal, right? If you read all of 1 Corinthians 11, beginning verse 12 and following, if you read all of 1 Corinthians 11 uh, and you come away with any other idea in, or 17 rather and following and you come away with any other idea then this is some the, the lord's supper is something we're supposed to do as a community i would challenge to i, I would love to hear your, your the reading of that because i don't think there's another way to interpret it so we are against uh, this idea that you can exclude people from the table Right, but we are in favor of the idea that we can include people who couldn't otherwise participate in the table by extending the Lord's Supper to them, um, by bringing that to their homes if they're unable to travel to the place where we worship. So, all right, so how about a couple more practices to avoid here in paragraph four? Okay, practices contrary to the nature of the sacrament and to the institution of it by Christ are private masses, right? So that's the priest by himself or receiving the sacrament alone from a priest or anyone else, right? So that's the idea that you alone would receive it and that it's not part of a community uh, event that's going on. Again, they're not against shutting communion. I, oftentimes we get people arguing this point. Uh, if nothing else, our own um, book of order in the EPC clearly says that, that we're supposed to bring communion to people who are unable to participate in worship because uh, largely because of health reasons, right? So that's extending the table. What they're telling you is you can't say, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of the specials and nobody else gets, I don't want other people around, right? Or we're gonna use a much better vintage of wine when I'm taking the Lord's Supper and I don't wanna pay for that for everybody, you know, that kind of thing. So that's what they're against. They're saying, nope, not gonna do it again denying the cup to the congregation. So if in paragraph three, we said things positively. Paragraph four, we're saying them negatively, right? You can't deny the cup to people, right? The idea that, oh, well, they might spill, right? Well, that's not a reason to deny the cup, right? We are told that both the bread and the cup are part of the sacramental meal and all of the disciples of Jesus are to participate in both the bread and the cup. Okay, we don't worship the bread, right? We talked about Roman Catholics believing that you, in transubstantiation, that Christ is, is literally present in the bread from the moment that the mass is complete. And so that bread is the presence of Jesus and it can be worshiped and adored, right? We don't worship the wine, right? With Christ's presence is there, right? We, um, we don't lift them up, right? So um, this is something that's really hard to do when you want people to be able to see the Lord's Supper. Right, but we don't elevate uh, the elements above our head, right, as if they're objects of worship, because it's bread and, in our case, juice. The reason we do that is, is we're trying to accommodate people who struggle with uh, alcoholism, right, and so we don't want people to be excluded from the table because we're serving wine, and you know, and they're struggling with that uh, addiction, and so we want them to be included. So we use wine that hasn't sat around very long, what we call juice, right? Okay. Um, so we don't elevate these things because they're not objects of worship and we don't carry them around for adoration. We don't save some, right? We don't have a tabernacle where we put this stuff away, right? For any counterfeit religious use, right? We don't do anything with these, right? The elements are simply the elements, right? And when they are being used in the sacramental moment, then the Holy Spirit is in some way active in communicating the spiritual presence of Christ, the elements aren't magic, right? They're not magic. There's nothing about them that's magic, right? They were bread and in our case, juice beforehand. And afterwards they will be bread and juice, 
right? Bread and juice for, before, bread and juice after, that's all they are. That's all they are. And yet in the sacramental moment, they become useful to the Holy Spirit to communicate the grace of Jesus Christ one way or another. So, paragraph five, the bread and wine in this, here's a, this is one of the things that bugs you in, the, in modern English. There's a, a spacing problem with this paragraph. It just bugs me, but anyways. <laughs> The bread and wine in the sacrament properly set apart to uh, the uses ordained by Christ so relate to him crucified that tr truly and yet only sacramentally they are sometimes called by the name of what they represent, that is the body and the blood of Christ. Right? So in Matthew's telling of the worship institution, clearly Jesus says this is my body, clearly Jesus says this is my blood. Right. And so what we're saying is that in that sacramental union, right, there's such a close joining together between the sign and what is signified in the moment of the sacrament that you can call the sign that which is signified and that which is signified by the name of the sign, right? It, it can be, you can refer one to the other. It's coherent to you, right? The bread is not literally the body of Christ. The cup is not literally full of the blood of Christ. Rather, it is a sign that points to the body and blood of Christ that was given for you on the cross. Even so, they still remain in substance, there's that Aristotelian idea, and nature, only bread and wine, as they were before their sacramental use, right? So they're talking substance that's specifically dealing with transubstantiation. Nature is probably a reference to consubstantiation, but I'm not a Lutheran, so I, 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 that's the way I've always understood that and read that. Um, so we are saying they um, are bread and wine, that's what they were beforehand, and that's what they'll be afterwards, but in the moment of the sacramental use, we can refer to them as the body and blood of Jesus, right, because the sign is pointing to that which is signified, namely the bread and the wine to the body and blood of Jesus, right, but that doesn't mean they literally are those things, because it doesn't have to be a simile to be a metaphor, okay, so they're going to continue on this front, because we want to Anytime the Westminster divines can throw sharp elbows at the Roman Catholics, they are going to do it, right? And so we might title paragraph six, the trouble with transubstantiation. So teaching that the substance of the bread and wine is changed into the substance of Christ's body and blood, usually called transubstantiation, by the consecration of a priest or any other means is subjectable not only to scripture, but even to the common sense and reason. Such teaching overturns the nature of the sacrament and has been and is the cause of much superstitions and indeed flagrant idolatry, right? So the text below uh, the Luke 24, 39, 6 and 39 texts plainly state that Jesus has ordinary flesh and blood. Right? It's not his, his body and blood are not magic body and blood. They're human body and blood, right? That's all they are. Um, we also want to understand that Jesus in Acts 3.21, right, Jesus is clearly in heaven now. He's not making return trips to earth until the end, right, and so he's in heaven, and we remember Jesus in the sacrament, which seems to indicate that he is not physically present, because you don't typically have to remember people if they're in the room with you, right, they're right there. You don't have to rely on your memory for such things, okay, plus the Westminster lines are very clear, right? Reason does not command scripture, but scripture rather commands reason. But when we use reason in this regard, it's pretty clear. It's like, this doesn't make much sense. And if something doesn't make much sense from both a doctrinal standpoint in the way we think about what the scripture has said and from the plain letters of scripture, it's probably not true, right? So you may have Roman Catholic friends and family, and you will note that as a Presbyterian, you are not allowed to take communion with them unless you hold to transubstantiation. They believe transubstantiation is so important that if you don't hold to it, you can't keep communion with them. In Missouri Synod and Wisconsin Synod, uh, Lutheran churches, you are not allowed to take communion with them um, because you do not hold to consubstantiation because they think it is so important that you understand that Christ is physically present in that way, uh, that to not do so would mean that you should not, that we are not in accord. And if we're not in accord, we should take communion together. In Presbyterian churches, we teach that this is Christ's table, right? And that if you have a faith in Jesus, and if you have been called by him to be his disciple, 
then you should come and taste and see the Lord is good. But we certainly have our own views on the Lord's Supper, that Christ is not physically present, but rather is spiritually present in the Supper. So pay attention sometimes to the prayers I give. I give lots of hints to that um, as we're moving through things, right? So Westminster divines are clear that they think that this is superstitious. Uh, and it has led to idolatry, especially worshiping bread and wine, right? You worship in the creation uh, instead of the creator. Uh, and so they would say that both that, that on those two things alone, this transubstantiation should be deemed dubious. Uh, and from a scriptural standpoint, it should be rejected. Okay. So spiritual presence uh, is what we're going to deal with in paragraph seven here. So worthy receivers physically partaking of visible substances of the sacrament, do then also by faith actually and in fact, but not physically or bodily, spiritually receive on and feed on Christ crucified and on all the benefits of his death, right? So spiritual, spiritually present, not physically present, right? When you're chomping down on the bread, you're not eating Jesus, right? But Jesus is present, right? In that spiritual way, in the communicating power of the Holy Spirit, right? Is present. Right, so we, again, not ordinance only view where Jesus says do this and there's no presence. We believe that Christ is spiritually present, right? either in parallel with taking the elements or through the elements, Christ is spiritually present with us. Okay, the body and blood of Christ are not then bodily or physically in, with, or under the bread and wine, those various arguments from transubstantiation and consubstantiation, but they are actually spiritually present to the faith of believers in the administration of the sacrament, just as the bread and wine are physically present, right? So Christ is, his body and blood are spiritually present to you, just as his, um, the bread and wine are physically present, right? So that language can lend you either to Calvin's view, where they are spiritually present through the physical presence or Bollinger's view. And I think it leans you more toward Bollinger again, but I'm biased. That's happens to be my viewpoint um, that they are present in parallel, right? So the physical presence of the elements and the spiritual presence of Christ's body and blood are moving and basically in lockstep together uh, through this. Okay. So let's take a, a, a little bit of a longer look at, Paul's lesson in 1 Corinthians 11. So let me grab, so we're going to come up here to the beginning, right? So you need to understand the problem so you understand why the words of institution are the solution uh, and why Paul has to give the last instructions he gives here. It says, in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. So there's fighting, there's factionalism. And I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized, right? So there's going to be conflict in the church. There's going to be conflict in lots of churches throughout the ages um, so that we can uh, separate the genuine from the uh, false. That's Paul's point. It says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, right? So now he's getting into something specific. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk, right? So you're making a mockery of the Lord's Supper, right? So everyone brings their own stuff. They eat their own thing. Some people don't have anything. And some people, in the case of wine, drink too much. Not the Lord's Supper, right? Everyone should be an equal participant in the Lord's Supper. It says what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, right? If you were hungry, you should have eaten something before. If you were thirsty, you should have drank something before, right? You don't need to um, basically hoard uh, and exclude people um, from worship. It says, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing, right? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not, right? So this is the problem, right? So not everyone is equally participating in the Lord's Supper, right? There are people who have an abundance, and there are people who have nothing, right? And he says, that's a problem because this is supposed to be a community meal. So the words of institution come in and he reminds them that this meal is given to all of the disciples, right? And that we are to celebrate this as a group of disciples, right? But at the end of it, Paul says, okay, and if you don't do that, there's a problem, right? So one, 
you have to come ready to receive the grace of Jesus Christ, right? You need to come to this table uh, in a way that, that shows that you are repentant of your sins, right? So earlier in 1 Corinthians, Paul has brought forward, especially in chapter 5, uh, Paul brings forward a number of issues, and chapter 6 has some too, um, a number of issues that the Corinthians are getting involved in that shows that they are not taking seriously um, church discipline. Right. And so he says, look, you have to come in a way that is disciplined, right? That shows that you are, uh, you, yes, you are a sinner in need of grace. But you're that special kind of sinner. You're the repentant kind of sinner, right? So the Apostle Paul says, because this is a proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes, he therefore says in verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread, or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Now, there's a lot of controversy over what, you, over what the Apostle Paul means unworthy manner. Uh, and the answer is, you know, there's a lot of ideas of what unworthy can mean. But certainly uh, unworthy would be somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus. Unworthy would be somebody who is engaging in gross sin and pretending that it is not sin, right? Self-justifying behavior, right? Unworthy, it, it can mean a lot of things, right? Which is why in verse 28, he says, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the, of the bread and drink of the cup, right? So you are to examine yourself before you come to the table. Right? It's a very important thing that we do in the prayer confession, especially on communion Sundays, but on all Sundays that you are given a moment to examine yourself and confess your sins. That's something you should be doing in your prayers on a regular basis, right? Perhaps daily. In my case, sometimes more than daily. <laughs> you know, sometimes a few times a day, we you know, need to go before the Lord and confess and repent, right? That's just what we need to do, right? So that, and you're supposed to be doing that for yourself when you come, right? So you go, well, you know, nobody asked me about it, so it's no big deal. Well, yeah, it's a big deal. But most um, church discipline is intrapersonal. It's something you are working out with Jesus, right? Most church discipline is that way. Only when your sin becomes so, so heinous or so public or so gross, you know, as in large, um, that, that you can't work that out for yourself do we have to engage in church discipline, which is why church discipline is the next chapter now following this because of this examine this process of examine. It says, for anyone who eats and drinks uh, without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, our Catholic and Lutheran says, we'll see, say right there, see, you have to discern the body, right? That Christ is present in the elements. But we would say, no, the context suggests that body here is not referring to the body of Jesus. It's referring to the community of the church, right? You have to understand that you are connected into this church and that we belong to Jesus together, right? And if we're not taking into account that community aspect of this, we're eating in an unworthy manner, okay? That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died, right? So the Apostle Paul is really laying it on here. He says, look, this is so important that if you get this wrong, some of you are getting weak, some of you are getting sick, and indeed some of you have even died because the Lord is trying to chastise this congregation. He's trying to tell you, no, do this decently and in order. It says, but if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. For when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world, right? So church discipline, um, even judgment in this case, right, is not condemnation, but rather it is being chastened. It's being told not that way, this way. So he concludes, so then my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, right? So Lord's Supper, right? The sacrament is not meant to be a full meal, right? If you're hungry and you're counting on the Lord's Supper to fill you up, probably not, right? Because we have to share, share this around with everybody, right? So if you're hungry, you should probably have something to eat first. So, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things, I will give directions when I come. Now, we don't know what the other things are, and we don't know what directions he gave later, but that's, we know that there's more to this, right? So what he wants you to say, right? So the idea here is worship for Christians uh, at this point in time would separate it into two services. You'd have a pre-dawn service, right? Where you'd get together because everybody, Sunday was a work day, right? Everybody worked on Sunday. So you'd have a pre-dawn service where you'd get together largely prayer service, 
Uh, you do baptisms then if there were baptisms to be had. Uh, and then you would come, you go to work. And then at the end of the day, you'd come back together. Uh, and then you would have um, another worship service, right? You might have a uh, love feast, as Paul will call them, which would be like a potluck. Um, but then during the worship service, you would also celebrate the Lord's Supper, right? That's where the sermon would be. That's where the Lord's Supper would be celebrated. And he says, look, if, if you can't wait, right, um, and you're going to eat, you know, more than your share of, of the sacramental meal, have something to eat first. Right. You don't have to fast before you come to the Lord's Supper. You don't have to fast before you come to the Lord's Supper. Just have something to eat. And then when you come to the Lord's Supper, then you will uh, be able to wait and you will and you'll be able to share uh, amongst the brethren. OK, uh, one more uh, quick idea here uh, from Second uh, Corinthians. Uh, oops, I don't have that one pulled up. Let me grab it real quick. Second. No, I need a two there. Okay. Here, the apostle says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We talked about this in the context of marriage, but it is wider context than that. It says, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Right. So there is this idea that we need that our fellowship is for believers, right? It's for believers. And so the table is for believers. And so we fence our table and we warn people that if your faith is not in Jesus, if you've not been baptized, then this table is actually spiritually dangerous for you. And so the Westminster Divines want to make that abundantly clear, right? They want to make that abundantly clear by warning people in the final paragraph uh, of our chapter tonight. So, so though ignorant or wicked men may partake of the physical substance in the sacrament, right? So we can't go around knocking the sacrament out of people's hands because we think they're ignorant or wicked men. Ignorant men don't know, right? Jesus, wicked men know that they're not followers of Jesus and they're going to do it anyway. So we don't, right, that we understand that we, even when we do our best to fence the tables, to warn people about coming in an unworthy manner, that that's still going to happen from time to time, okay? But when they do, we're told, they do not receive what is signified by them, right? So they may receive the physical elements, but they don't receive the spiritual presence of Christ, his body and blood communicated to their souls by the Holy Spirit. However, by their unworthy coming to the Lord's table, they are guilty of his body and blood and bring judgment upon themselves, right? That's what we're reading in 1 Corinthians 11 there. Therefore, just as the ignorant and ungodly are not fit to enjoy communion with Christ, neither are they worthy to come to the Lord's table, right? Which is, you know, a communion with Christ and with the brethren. And as long as they remain ignorant and ungodly, they cannot and must not be allowed to partake of the holy mystery of communion without committing a great sin against Christ, right? So we warn them, we tell you not to do it. We used to be more pointed in this, right? We used to give you little tokens, right? After you've been examined by the elders and then those, you had to turn in your token before you could come get the Lord's Supper. We don't do that anymore. But now we, we warn you, dire warning for you that this table is spiritually dangerous for you if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So if that's you, then you should just let the elements pass you by, right? But it should also create sort of like a um, holy ambition, a holy jealousy that says, no, I want to participate in that. What leads me to be able to participate in that? And the answer is um, faith in Jesus and baptism leads you to the table. Uh, and so that's uh, why we want to warn people, but we also want to invite them to to come out of their ignorance and their wickedness and ungodliness and enter into faith and salvation in Christ. So that's Reformed teaching on uh, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Uh, I know that this paragraph spends a lot of time telling you what we don't believe, um, but what we do believe is that Christ is spiritually present. Right? And because of that, the Holy Spirit is able to communicate his grace to us uh, and so we are nourished in Christ, even as we are joined together with him and with one another. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for your word for us tonight. 
And certainly we want to come to Christ at the table and we want to taste and see that you are good. We want to have communion with him by your Holy Spirit and with one another by that same spirit. So we thank you, Lord, for giving us this sacrament that we may remember your sacrifice, that we may participate in it spiritually through your Holy Spirit, that we may be so nourished that we would follow after you and give you all glory. In Jesus' name, indeed.